You know, for just a few dollars, you can buy like a little plastic bobblehead Jesus that bounces on a metal, metal spring. I sent Greg a video last night with Jesus kind of nodding his head. But you can buy one that adheres firmly to the dashboard of your car. One advertisement for this product actually says you can stick him wherever you need forgiveness. And he will guide you through the valley of gridlock. The dashboard Jesus. When the song Plastic Jesus, Billy, jo Billy Idol sings, With my plastic Jesus, goodbye and I'll go far. With my plastic Jesus sitting on the dashboard of my car. Paul Newman sang it in the movie Cool Hand Luke. The words begin, well, I don't care if it rains or freezes. Long as I have my plastic Jesus sitting on the dashboard of my car. Now to lots of people, Jesus, his church, our Christian faith, their cultural Trappings, maybe, but not life-changing realities. Author Josh McDowell warns that many people today see Jesus like a plastic statue sitting on a car dashboard, smiling, robed, maybe a halo suspended above his head, but that, that's a superstitious and sentimental view of Jesus, and that view of Jesus is a myth. Jesus of Nazareth was, was no plastic saint. He's a real world kind of savior. Now, it's not important whether you have Jesus on your car's dashboard, but it's vital that he's living in your heart. He isn't plastic. He's powerful. He's not small. He's infinite. He's not a good luck token. He's the risen Lord of time and eternity, But sometimes we treat Jesus like he's our good luck token, like he's there simply to bless us, to bless our businesses and to make sure we win all of our athletic events and, and, and don't get hurt doing anything, even if we're doing something stupid. You know, like he's some kind of a, a good luck charm or genie in a bottle, but that's not who Jesus is. And the more we try to make him fit into that mold, the more he tries to break out of it. And reveal himself to us as he really is. So today we're going to take a journey through scripture. From beginning to end. Now no, we're not going to be here till 6 p.m. I promise. But we're going to start in Genesis and wind up in Revelation. And we're going to look at what happened when people found themselves face to face with the living, creating, holy, righteous, all-powerful, all-knowing, always present, everywhere God of the universe. And we're going to start at the beginning. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. Now let me set the stage for you. Scripture begins with God creating the cosmos. All that is. The universe, the multiverse, whatever everything is, God created it simply by speaking. All that is, whether we are aware of its existence or, or even can reach that plane of existence, all that is, is created and sustained by God. See, Jesus is saying yes. And here, in our little corner of the solar system called the Milky Way galaxy, and in our little cul-de-sac, our solar system, God created a planet capable of sustaining life. And he breathed life into this little planet we simply call Earth. And as God created life sprang forth, he added a special part of creation formed not by the word of his mouth, but by the work of his hands. And he called that special part of creation humanity. And he gave humanity a, little, a special little corner of this planet, the Garden of Eden, as a playground. And everything they needed was there. But God also wanted them and us through them to choose to love him. Because for love to be love, it has to be freely given by choice. It's not coerced. And for us to choose to love God, there had to be the option to choose to love ourselves instead of God. And that option came in the form of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
Uh, God told Adam and Eve, our spiritual and physical predecessors, <coughs> you can eat anything you want in the garden. This whole garden is yours, except for the fruit of this one tree. And of course, you know that tempted by Satan in the form of a serpent, Adam and Eve did eat that fruit. And when they did, they became aware of their nakedness. And they sewed fig leaves together as the first ever pairs of underwear. Now let's look at Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? So God is walking in the garden in the evening, in the cool of the day. The word translated as walking here, God was walking in the cool of the, in the garden, is in a, a Hebrew, a special Hebrew verb form that suggests that this was something that God did regularly. It was his habit. So today in English, we might add the words, as was his custom, or like he always did, right? So God was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, like he always did. It was the custom of God to spend time in his creation with his highest creation, human, humanity, walking around in the garden. It was something that God and Adam and Eve did regularly in the evening. But on this day, something is different. God is there walking in the garden, but Adam and Eve are nowhere to be found. They're hiding from God because they've done the one thing that God told them they were not to do. This was no game of hide and seek. They were afraid, and so they hid from God. So God called out, where are you? Now think about that for a minute. Did the all-knowing, always fully present everywhere God really not know where Adam and Eve were? Of course not. Did God really not know what they had done? Of course not. God knew exactly where they were and what they had done, but God doesn't go marching into the garden like you and I might when we realize that something, our children have done something wrong in the house and we go to the part of the house where they are and we go marching in, you know, with those heavy footsteps and we're ready to, you know, lay down the law, pushing up our sleeves. What do you think you're doing? That's not what God does. He asks the question, Adam... Where are you? God doesn't drive them out. He draws them out. He responds with tenderness, not toughness. Oh, there will be punishment meted out to be sure. But our view of God here is typically that God is angrily doing all this. And there's no evidence of that in Scripture. He isn't responding in uncontrolled anger here. He's responding tenderly and I think in sadness. The relationship with God that Adam and Eve and God had enjoyed has been severed. It's been destroyed. The very first encounter a human being has with God after the creation reveals a God who wants and seeks relationship with his people. And that God responds firmly, yes, but tenderly and with great sadness when they disobeyed him and destroyed that relationship. God knew where they were, and God knew what they'd done. But he doesn't go in there heavy. He goes in there seeking to draw them out. Adam, where are you? Well, we were naked, so he hid. Who, who told you you were naked? Did you eat of the fruit I told you not to eat of? Of course, Adam says, the woman made me do it. Because that's what us men have been doing for years. Since the very first man. It's her fault. And what does Eve do? It's a snake's fault. And the snake looks around. And there's no one else to blame. 
God wants a relationship with you. And in the very first word God utters after this, which is his curse upon the serpent, he sets in motion his plan to restore that relationship. The first messianic prophecy is right here in Genesis chapter 3, and it's uttered by God himself. He tells Adam and Eve and the serpent and us exactly what he's going to do. I mean, look down in verse 15. I will put, he's talking to the serpent, remember. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. And then he says this, he shall bruise your head. Her offspring, one of her offspring will, you will bruise his head. Or he will bruise your head, you will bruise his heel. In other words, you'll strike him as a serpent. You'll make him feel pain. But he will crush your head. He will destroy you. Satan, your time is limited. Right there. God wants a relationship with you. He is pursuing you and that relationship. In spite of everything that you've done, in spite of all the wrong that lives inside you and me, God is pursuing us and wants a relationship with us. God deeply loves us. The very first time someone stood face to face with God, they found intimacy, and then that intimacy destroyed. God is a God who wants relationship with his people. Now, the second passage we're going to look at is found in Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. This is a story about Moses coming face to face with God. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led that flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the middle of the bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I'll turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. And then he said, don't come near. Take your sandals off your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face. For he was afraid to look at God. Now the Bible tells us that it was the angel of the Lord appearing to Moses as a flame in a bush. The angel of the Lord. Now when the Bible uses that phrase, it isn't talking about an angel as we think about angels. It's referring to to God himself, manifest and fully present, in a form that is fully God and yet distinct from God, it represents God fully present and protecting his people. So the angel of the Lord is God accommodating himself in a way that he, a holy and righteous God, can be present among a sinful people. I mean, that's the problem God now has, right? He's holy and he's righteous. And after the relationship was broken by our disobedience, after we became unholy and unrighteous, that's the problem. How does a righteous and holy God make himself known to an unholy and unrighteous creation without his holiness simply consuming and destroying them? And he does that through this angel of the Lord, by entering their crea his creation in a form that they can fathom. Who does that sound like? Jesus. God in the flesh. 
God incarnate, right? Moses is standing face to face with the pre-incarnate Christ, the second member of the Trinity. Because that's how God reaches out to us. He's standing face to face with Christ, the Son. And Moses hides his face because he's afraid to look at God. Adam and Eve weren't afraid when they were holy and righteous. And then they became afraid because their unholiness reacted to God's holiness. And the same thing happens with Moses. There's a Christian author named Rebecca Pippert. At one point in her life, she was an agnostic. I mean, she was someone who wasn't sure if God existed or not. And she had one question as an agnostic that she continually rested, wrestled with. And that question was, how can finite, limited human beings ever claim to know God? How do they know they're not being deceived? And then she says, one sunny day, I was stretched out on the lawn. And I noticed that some ants were busy building a mound. And I, I began to redirect their steps with twigs and leaves. But they simply bounced off and started a new ant mound. And I thought, this is like being God. I'm redirecting their steps and they don't even realize it. And she says, at one point, two ants crawled onto my hands. And I thought, wouldn't it be funny if one ant turned to the others and said, do you believe in Becky? Do you believe Becky really exists? I imagine the other ant answering, don't be ridiculous. Becky's a myth, a fairy tale. How comical, I thought, the hubris of that ant declaring that I don't exist when I could easily blow it off my hands. But what if the other ant said, oh, I believe that Becky exists? How would they resolve it? How could they know that I am real? And I thought, what would I have to do to reveal to them who I am? And suddenly I realized the only way to reveal who I am in a way that they could understand would be to become an ant myself. I would have to identify totally with their sphere of reality. I sat upright and remember thinking, what an amazing thought. The scaling down of the size of me to perfectly represent who I am in the form of an ant. I know, I could do tricks, things that no other ant could do. Then it hit me. I had just solved my problem of how finite creatures could ever discover God. God would have to come from the outside and reveal who he is. And that's what God does in Jesus. Christ is God so that we can understand him. And whenever the Old Testament writes the words, the angel of the Lord, that's who the Bible is referring to, the pre-incarnate Christ. So Moses is standing in the presence of Christ, and he's told not to come near the bush and to take his shoes off. Why? Because the ground he was standing on was holy because God was there. Now, holiness and righteousness, they're, two, they're related, but they're two different things. To be righteous is to be morally pure, to be right before God. To be holy is to be set apart for God's special use. So think about it this way. How many of you had a grandma who had special plates and cups and silverware, right? That only came out on special occasions, right? Christmas dinner, Thanksgiving dinner, maybe a baptism celebration, Easter, those kinds of things. They were set aside for very special use. You know, Grandma got the fine china out. Right? Nobody wants china anymore. I think we've got three sets now. <laughs> Aubrey will be getting one, I'm sure. <laughs> that she doesn't want or need. But we used to have these things that were set aside or, or in the guest bathroom, 
special towels for when people came over, you know. Don't wash, don't dry your hands on the special guest towels. My hands are wet, though, right? It was set aside for special use. Something is holy when it's set aside for God's special use. In that sense, you and I as children of God, as followers of Jesus, are holy, set apart for him. And in this moment, the ground around this bush is holy because that's where he is. It's being set aside for his special use. So Moses couldn't stand there and even without shoes, he still had to keep his distance because otherwise God's holiness would destroy him, an unholy man. You see, God's holiness is not like some kind of a passive attribute, like the color of your hair or eyes, right? Just a part of, you know, nice enough and interesting enough, but they don't really do anything to anyone else. You know, the color of Greg's beard, that salty gray, doesn't have any impact on me. Just, but it's an attribute. That's a passive attribute. God's holiness isn't passive like that. It's active. And it actively consumes all that offends it and embraces all that confirms it. Kind of like, kind of like fire. Fire consumes what's flammable. But it embraces... I'm making a mess here. Fire itself. God's holiness is a part of who God is. It isn't something that God commands. It's something God is. And the act of being holy by nature consumes and destroys all that isn't holy around God. God can't set aside his holiness. So that we can relate to him. So Moses needed to keep his distance even as God sought to communicate with him. And he had to remove his shoes. In other words, he was told he just had to simply obey God and approach God as God instructed him. And that's something we struggle with. Approaching God on his terms. Coming to God as he instructs us. We think we can come to God without Jesus. We think we can come to God our own way. And we each have unique expressions of our relationship with God, but we have to come to God the way God instructs us to come to him, to approach him the way that he instructs us to approach him, because he's holy. And then Moses hid his face. I mean, the presence of the pre-incarnate Christ was so awesome even as just a flame in a bush, fire, flame. And these appearances of God from here on out, there's a lot of fire and smoke and flame, holiness. Moses couldn't even bring himself to look at God. God longs for and pursues a relationship with you and me, but his holiness keeps us away because without holiness of our own, we can't approach God. We'd be consumed. Now, Isaiah and Ezekiel get even more dramatic visions of God. Turn first to Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. 
Isaiah's vision of God was so breathtaking and so overpowering that the only thing about God himself that Moses or that Isaiah could describe was the train of his robe. His eyes couldn't go any higher than that. And he chose instead to describe the heavenly king's mighty attendants, the seraphim. Now, when most people think of angels, of cherubs and seraphs, cherubim and seraphim, as the Bible calls them, we think of those chubby little fat-bellied cherubs with wings, the stuff of, of Hallmark cards and cartoons, but the word seraphim literally means fiery ones or fiery serpents. That almost sounds like a dragon, doesn't it? I mean, look at verse 3. And one called to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. Now, Isaiah doesn't tell us how many of these creatures he saw. But when they speak, I mean, that's not the voice of God. That's the voice of these Dragon-like attendants of God. And when they speak, the foundations shake. It's like an earthquake. When St. John in the New Testament had a similar experience, he said that he saw thousands of thousands, literally millions of these magnificent creatures hovering in constant motion, ready to do the will of their master. And their voices alone, lifted in praise to the one they worship and serve, cause an earthquake. Dragons with six wings, two of which they each use to cover their faces in the presence of the majesty of God so that they don't see it. And two of which they cover their feet and two of which they sing. And the one word that these fiery, mighty winged creatures can say about God is holy. You are holy. And they say it over and over again. Holy, holy, holy. They aren't just repeating the word. They're emphasizing it. The threefold adjective in the Old Testament in Old Testament Hebrew is the superlative, the highest, the most holy. In fact, no other threefold adjective appears in the entire Old Testament. The holiness of God distinguishes him absolutely from all else that is, even from the sinless majesty of these angels. And the only thing about God himself that Moses... Or, Keep saying Moses. Isaiah could describe as the train of his robe, and he says that it filled the temple. From the perspective of ancient Israel, the temple was, you know, they, their land was a physical manifestation of the kingdom of God. That's now the role taken on by his church throughout the world. But at that time, it was the land of Israel. And the temple, you know, Jerusalem was the holy city. The temple was like God's palace. And the throne room of that palace was the Holy of Holies. And the throne of God was the Ark of the Covenant. And the mercy seat that was the cover of the Ark of the Covenant. And Isaiah can only say that the train of his robe filled the entire temple. If that filled the temple, then how big must the throne be and how, must, how big and massive and majestic must the God who sits on that throne be? So majestic is it that Isaiah himself doesn't even try to describe it. The Bible speaks of the majesty of God's holiness, the splendor of God's holiness, the incomparability of God's holiness. One person said that God's holy is, holiness is simply his godness in all of his attributes, in all of his works, in all of his ways. There's no good way in human language to describe it. So Isaiah turns to that which we so often turn to to describe or explain that which we can't describe or explain. He turns to song. And he didn't write this song. He simply wrote down what the seraphim with every breath proclaimed. Holy, holy, holy. 
that he has set apart and above all else, a holy God attended not by fat little seraphs, but by flaming dragons. Now flip over to Ezekiel chapter 1. Verse 1. In the 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the exiles by the Cheber River, the Cheber Canal, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. And then down in verse 4. As I looked, Behold, a stormy wind came out of the north, and a great cloud with brightness, there it is again, fire brightness around it, and fire flashing forth continually, and in the midst of the fire, as if it were gleaming metal. And from the midst of it came the likeness of four living creatures. These are not seraphim, they're cherubim. And this was their appearance. Again, he's really not trying to describe God, because he can't, he just describes that, everything else that he sees. They had a human likeness, but each had four faces, and each of them had four wings. Their legs were straight, and the soles of their feet were like the sole of a calf's foot. And they sparkled, again, brightness, like burnished bronze. And under their wings, on their four sides, they had human hands, and the four had their faces and their wings thus. Their wings touched one another, and each one of them went straight forward without turning as they went. As for their likeness of their faces, each had a human face. And the four had also the face of a lion on the right side, and the face of an ox on the left, and also the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. And their wings were spread out above. Each creature had two wings, each of which touched the wing of another while two covered their bodies. And then over in verse 22 to verse 25, over the heads of the living creatures, there was the likeness of an expanse, shining like awe-inspiring crystal spread out above their heads. And under the expanse of their wings were stretched out straight one toward another. And each creature had two wings covering its body. And when they went, I heard the sound of their wings like the sound of many waters, like the sound of the Almighty, the sound of a tumult, like the sound of an army. And when they stood still, they let down their wings. And there came a voice from above the expanse over their heads. And when they stood still, they let down their wings. Ezekiel goes on to describe these cherubim as God's throne bearers. They carry the throne of God and himself as God sits upon it. And they look like flaming humans with four faces and four wings each. Notice the four faces, a human face, the highest being in creation. A lion face, the highest of the wild animals. The face of an ox, a powerful bull, the highest of the domestic animals. And the face of an eagle, the highest of the birds. What is Ezekiel doing here? He's trying to describe that which cannot be described. He's saying, you can't, you haven't seen anything like these guys. And they aren't God. They're simply God's chamber attendants carrying his throne. I mean, he's doing his best just to describe them. And then he, Ezekiel does try as best he can to describe the one sitting on the throne. Look at verses 26 through 28. And above the expanse over their heads, there was the likeness of a throne, an appearance like sapphire. And seated above the likeness of a throne was a likeness with a human appearance. And up, upward from what had appeared, had the appearance of his waist, I saw as it were gleaming metal, like the appearance of fire enclosed all around. And downward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw as it were the appearance of fire, and there was brightness around him like the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud on the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness all around. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. Power, might, majesty, brightness, fire, holiness. Not a plastic Jesus. 
And what's the response of Isaiah and Ezekiel to these encounters with God? Look at Isaiah 6, 5. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And then Ezekiel 128, and when I saw it, I fell on my face. Ezekiel falls on his face before God. Isaiah comes undone. Do you realize that this is the God into whose presence you have come this morning? The God who allows you and I to know him, to worship him. And what do we do? We glance at our watches, wondering when the pastor will be done so we can get on with our day. We daydream. We fall asleep. Who do we think we are? And that right there is the problem of sin. Sin puffs us up and reduces God inside. It makes us more important and God less important until from our own perspective, we are the most important being in the universe and God is the least. Sin flips everything upside down. How different would you live if you knew that one day you would one day answer to a God, the writers of scripture themselves, who saw these things can barely describe. Surrounded and attended by servants that are multi-headed, multi-winged, mighty dragons, and they aren't breathing fire, they are fire. How different would you live if you knew you had to answer to that God? And the bad news is, no matter how hard you tried to live a life you could be proud of before that God, sin would always get the better of you. Before that God, you and I are toast. We're done. Isaiah, the prophet himself, despaired and wailed in hopelessness when he saw God in his throne room. And Isaiah had been living as rightly as possible before God. So what hope is there? Well, before we get to that, I want you to see one more encounter a person had with God. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 through 19. These, this is John's encounter with the risen Christ. And then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. In the middle of the lampstands was one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like white wool, like snow. I'm not saying he's blonde. People have tried to argue that, there's, that Jesus was white from all of those, from that passage. That's not white depicts righteousness, purity. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a surface furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. This is the encounter John, the disciple Jesus loved, had with the risen Christ while he was in exile on the island of Patmos out in the Mediterranean Sea. John is face to face with Jesus in his return to glory. The glory he set aside when he became a human. And John's words aren't really all that different from the words of Isaiah and Ezekiel, are they? The whiteness of purity, the brightness and flame of holiness. And coming out of his mouth, St. Paul calls it the sword of the spirit, the word of God. John sees it as a sword. Every word of this book that I hold in my hand that gathers dust on our bookshelves, unread, unpondered, unmeditated upon, has been spoken by Christ himself through prophets and apostles, and it's his gift of himself to us. And we can't bring ourselves to pick it up. It's too boring. We can't find the time to participate in a Bible study. We're too busy. Who do we think we are? And what's John's response to being in the presence of the one whom we could easily argue was his best friend 
when he walked this earth. John is known as the disciple Jesus loved. Does that mean he didn't love the others? No, but Jesus' love for John and John's love for Jesus were remarkable. They were close. And what's John's response to being in the presence of Jesus now? Hey, what's up, dude? Get... No. Look down at verse 17. When I saw him, I fell at his feet, though dead, as though dead. John falls on his face motionless before the one who all those years before had washed his feet in the upper room. Who was beaten and spit upon and whipped until he couldn't stand. Who was nailed to a cross and mocked by the crowds as he died. John falls on his face before the majesty of Jesus. That does not sound like a plastic Jesus, does it? And having lived a holy, righteous, sinless life, he died in our place on our behalf, the death that by rights before God we should each have to die. And God is more than capable of carrying out that sentence. But he carried it out on his, himself. He carried it out on Christ. And Christ in return offers to us his holiness and his righteousness. So that we can come before this mighty, holy, righteous God who is attended by flaming dragons with confidence. That is our hope. Now, there's one more passage I want to look at this morning in closing. It's found at the end of the book of Revelation. Flip over to Revelation 21 verses 1 through 4. And then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. The tainted, the unholy is now gone. And the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And then I heard a loud voice from the throne. This is God's voice saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them. And they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. What are we seeing here? That relationship that was severed in the Garden of Eden. Now restored. Our unholiness dealt with. And consumed on the cross. No more distance. No more barriers. God with his creation. As it was always intended to be. With. He was with Adam and Eve. Walking in the garden every day. And at the end of scripture. God himself proclaims. The dwelling place of God. Is once again with you. And you're my people. And I'm with you as your God. Are you going to say no to this God? Who do we think we are? Well, one dad tells this story of a trip he took with his family. He says, a few summers ago, we took a family vacation to Toronto. We'd never been there. And we didn't know what to see, but all the guidebooks said, you have to go up the CN Tower. You did that, right, Aubrey, when you went to Toronto? Did you go up the tower? <laughs> Why didn't you go up the tower? Because it's too tall, right? It's the world's tallest building and the world's tallest freestanding structure. He says, I didn't think this was a good idea, like Aubrey didn't, because I have a great fear of heights. So just the thought of being 1,815 feet above the ground made me queasy. But the kids said, oh, Dad, we got to go. Come on, Dad. So against my better judgment, we went. I was the last one into the elevator, and I turned around, as some unwritten law of elevator says you're supposed to do. You ever notice that? Everybody faces the door. And then we started up. And it was only then that I realized that the door of this elevator was actually made of glass. And that this elevator was affixed to the outside of the tower. 
So as we rushed up the side of the CN Tower, I could see the city of Toronto falling away at my feet. I was only inches from the door and from the air outside in a free fall. My palms started sweating. My throat got tight, and I started breathing really fast. And I told myself, just hang on. Soon you'll be on the observation floor. So I stumbled out of the elevator onto the observation floor where I thought it would be safe, but I found that some sadist had installed a glass floor there so that people could walk on it and look straight down to the ground. The kids were laughing as they walked onto the glass floor and they jumped up and down and even laid down on it. Come on, Dad, they yelled. I didn't care how thick those blocks of glass were. They were installed by the contractor with the lowest bid. So I wasn't going to chance it. That same year, he says, we went to the Grand Canyon where you can stand at the South Rim and peer 6,000 feet straight down. At the Grand Canyon, you are not separated from your doom by blocks of glass two and a half inches thick. So every year, an average of four or five people die while visiting. Some of those deaths happening because in one website's words, overzealous photographic endeavors. <laughs> the all too familiar death by selfie. Still, the Grand Canyon is so beautiful that I was drawn to it. I had to see it, to get near it. I knew I couldn't do anything too foolish near the edge, but the same awesome beauty that caused me fear drew me toward it. When the Bible talks about fearing God, he says, what is it talking about? Is it talking about the kind of fear I felt at the CN Tower, or is it more like the fear I felt at the Grand Canyon? Then he says this, for most of my life, most of my Christian life, preachers and writers have told me it's like the fear I felt at the CN Tower. When the Bible says to fear God, they say, it doesn't really mean fear. It means awe or reverence. You should respect God, of course, but you don't need to actually fear him. It's like you're standing on the glass floor 1,100 feet up in the CN Tower. Being there may give you a thrill or a quick feeling of awe, but you're completely safe. So if you don't feel any terror with God, it's unnecessary, real, even irrational. That all sounded good. I believe that. And I told other people that. But the Bible disagrees. Isaiah prophesies, the Lord Almighty is the one you are to fear. <laughs> and Isaiah knew that. He is the one you're to dread. And Jesus says, fear God who has the power to kill you and then throw you into hell. Yes, he is the one to fear. So when the Bible talks about fearing God, it means not just awe and not just reverence. It also means fear. It's the kind of fear I felt at the Grand Canyon where I was drawn to the amazing beauty, but I also felt a realistic fear at the danger because people who act foolishly near it have died. How often do we act foolishly in the presence of God? Not just here in this room, but out there during the week, when we think no one is looking, when we think no one is there. We think we worship a plastic Jesus, but we don't. We worship a God who is holy, who is mighty, who the prophets themselves could not find words to describe. They could barely describe his attendants, his angels. And they described them as dragons of fire. Who do we think we are? Let's pray. Father, may we come into your presence with reverence and with awe and with fear but also with boldness because of what Jesus has done for us and with incredible gratitude because there isn't a person in this room who deserves to stand in your presence but we get to because Jesus has given his holiness to us even though we don't deserve it and so often don't reflect it his gift and today all we can do is humbly receive it we can't earn it but may we allow you to transform us who do we think we are 
to think we can come into your presence and leave unchanged. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.